Well, welcome everyone, and thank you all for coming today. I'm George Blumenthal, I'm the Chancellor at UC Santa Cruz, and um, I'm really happy to be here. And I was uh, very pleased when I first saw the plans for this event to take place. This time, the time is certainly now to talk about the changing face of the libraries. And, um, you know, these are not some far off happenings. Libraries are, have already changed, and it's important to stay ahead of the curve of these changes. There's an old slogan that I was thinking about in regard to this symposium, and basically it, the, the old slogan was, this isn't your father's Oldsmobile. Well, this isn't your father's library either. Um, it's not even your older sister's library, for that matter. Libraries are not only changing profoundly, they're changing rapidly. You know, before giving this talk, I decided to do some quick research on the, to get a historical perspective on libraries, specifically how long they've been around. And then it dawned on me, right then, at that instant, I was opening up a new browser window. I was not going to the library to get that information. And that was just proving my point. So my first stop was a Google search. And there I, there I discovered what I certainly first learned many years ago. Libraries are very old, very, very old. They date back at least 4,000 years to the days of our first urban civilization. But today's digital revolution is changing them again, especially here on college campuses in ways that might have been just unimaginable just a generation or two ago. They hardly resemble, or at least the early adopters don't, what libraries looked like even 10 years ago. Change is not always easy, especially when it involves books. People do have an emotional attachment to, to books. I do as well. So that in a sense, yes, there has been and will be a loss of sorts but it's not catastrophic. And it's important to note that access to nothing has been lost. Ultimately, we must remember there's much we gain by embracing the changing face of these facilities. Libraries will always be the keepers, the creators and the preservers of scholarly communication and knowledge. Now that information can be at your fingertips even sooner. And there's a broader range of material accessible some very nearly instantaneously. Suddenly we're able to reimagine space and buildings to better address the needs of our students and faculty. Ultimately, these changes are real opportunities, which is what excites me about a symposium like this one today. We are charting our future almost in real time. Now it's my pleasure to introduce the person who's behind today's uh, symposium. Elizabeth Cowell is a leading voice in state and national advocacy efforts on behalf of university libraries. She holds a Master of Science degree in Library and Information Science from the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana. Elizabeth has 20 years of management experience in academic libraries with a strong record of accomplishment and leadership in operations and innovation. We have been fortunate to have here on campus since 2008 and as university librarian since 2013. And incidentally, Elizabeth played a key role in the expansion and re renovation of the library you're sitting in right now. Changes that have resulted in a dramatic increase in library attendance. Please join me in welcoming Elizabeth Cowell. Great. Well, thank you, Chancellor Blumenthal, and welcome and thank all of you for coming to this event. What a great turnout um, on an important topic. The library has been the focus of a lot of attention, conversation, and controversy lately, especially around the Science and Engineering Collection project. I want to acknowledge that and say that changes happening in academic libraries nationally and worldwide do not come without a sense of loss. The first 15 years of my career were dedicated to the Federal Depository Library Program, providing access to government publications dating back to the founding of our nation. <clears throat> the internet drastically changed the work, making every library a depository library, and every librarian potentially a government documents librarian. It was a hard transition that is still happening. 
While not everyone has the expertise, the fact that even historical information is online makes it difficult for libraries to dedicate scarce resources to filling these specific positions. While there will always be major print collections like the one I worked with at Stanford and the Library of Congress, even the UC is working to create a system-wide rather than a campus-by-campus -campus archive of print and electronic copies. As I hear of longtime colleagues retiring around the country, it actually makes me sad to hear that the positions will not be replaced. At the same time, I think about the opportunity the online environment provides, and I marvel at the work of librarians protecting, preserving, and providing access to this important content. My colleague here today, Jeff Mackey Mason, has said, while the fundamental purpose of the university has not changed, the portfolio of strategies for fulfilling that purpose must evolve to meet new circumstances and opportunities. During the 50th anniversary of UCSC, we celebrated what this campus has been. Today, we have the opportunity to consider how the re research, teaching, and learning mission of the university has evolved during those 50 years and placed the university library at UC Santa Cruz in that context. Looking, I am looking forward to hear from our panelists and all of you and hope to have a broad, respectful conversation about the library, keeping in mind our principles of community. We have two librarians taking notes for the conversations after the panel, and we will make them available um, to the public, incorporating information from the speakers and your feedback, and this will be the basis of a broad visioning pro process for the library. I want to take a moment to thank everyone who contributed to today's event. The Committee on Library and Scholarly Communication, the Event Planning Committee, the Library Management Group, all the library staff who participated, and our co-sponsors, the Office of the EVC Provost, the Librarians Association of the University of California, Santa Cruz Chapter, um, and the Institute for Humanities Research, and finally, our speakers and our facilitators. We'll have a discussion and take questions after the three presentations. Following that, lunch will be served in the administrative suite. Just outside, we'll have signs and point you in that direction. Feel free to bring your lunch back into this room or anywhere in the library except for special collections. <laughs> and we will reconvene here at 1 p.m. for the afternoon panel. Also linked from the website for this event is uh, um, information about kind of an informal open house we're holding today, taking, a, um, whoops, taking place throughout the library. Sorry, I'm like <laughs> forwarding your. <laughs> so anyway, speakers. Mackenzie Smith is the university librarian at the University of California, Davis. She's charged with integrating it with digital resources and information technology to support the academic community of the 21st century. Mackenzie is a longtime academic research librarian. I'm not gonna say how many years, because it always makes me sad when I hear 20 years for me. <laughs> or actually, I should be happy about it. Um, she previously worked for the libraries at Harvard and MIT in Cambridge, Mass, where she led cutting edge projects on digital libraries and archives, such as the popular DSpace open source software platform web platforms for online scholarly communication, and digital curation in support of e-science. She has consulted widely in the library field, notably for the Association of Research Libraries, to design and lead its e-science institute and Creative Commons to develop its strategy for sharing scientific research data. Mackenzie is focused on the intersection of scholarly communication, technology, and libraries. Gunter Weidel, well, then I'll just introduce all of you and then we'll... Go. Gunter Weibel comes to, Cal um, to the California Digital Library with extensive experience in digital library and broader cultural heritage communities and is well known for his work in promoting cross-domain collaboration. In his previous position as the director of the Dig Digitization Program Office at the Smithsonian Institution, he oversaw the strategic plan for creating a digital creating a um, digital Smithsonian out of the institution's 19 museums and nine research centers. He was a finalist for the 2014 Samuel J. Hyman Service to America Medal, and his office has won three Smithsonian Secretary's Awards in the last three years for digital innovation, for collaborative spirit, and for scientific research. 
Prior to coming to the Smithsonian, Gunter promoted network-based solutions on behalf of an international collaborative of 140 research libraries as program officer for the Research Libraries Group and the OCLC Research Library Partnership. He has an MA in English Literature from Georgetown University and taught in the Digital Library Certificate Program for Syracuse University's iSchool from 2003 to 2008. And then finally, Jeff Mackey Mason is UC Berkeley's University Librarian and Chief Digital Scholarship Officer and Professor of School of Information and Professor of Economics. He was formerly the Dean of School of Information at the University of Michigan and the Arthur W. Burke's Collegiate Professor of Information and Computer Science and Professor in Economics and Public Policy. So a lot going on. <laughs> There he received the University Distinguished Faculty Achievement Award in 2010. Jeff earned his PhD in economics from MIT. He has a, been a pioneering scholar in the economics of the internet, online behavior, and digital information. His more than 85 publications appear in economics, computer science, law, and public policy, and library science journals. So please welcome and thank you for coming. Good morning, everyone. That's OK. Can I go back? Yes. I don't want to start the talk just yet. I want to uh, thank you very much for inviting me to come today, Elizabeth. It's a real pleasure to be here to talk about this, and especially on such a gorgeous day. So I'm, I'm sorry we're all in here, but um, this is a very important topic. So uh, bear with me. My role uh, today is to get you to think a little differently about libraries, not just in the classical sense of what they've done, but really their potential to support the university in new and I think very important ways. So I'm gonna speak for about 20 minutes and then uh, we'll move directly to the next presentation and on from there. And I apologize in advance for the very wordy slides. I think my colleagues did a better job of uh, making their slides legible for you in the way, way back. Um, but this was adapted from a chapter I'm writing for an NSF report. So um, that's why it's so texty. And uh, you can look at it later, I guess, if uh, you can't read it from there. So what I wanted to start off by saying is that universities have a big problem today. And that is that the modes and methods of research are changing dramatically in every discipline. They're more technology dependent. They're more data intensive. They're interdisciplinary and team-based and increasingly competitive for funding. So uh, funding agencies are increasingly looking for very few large grants and they're looking for um, fewer of those. So getting research done on university campuses is getting very difficult for um, an average PI who doesn't have access to incredibly fantastic resources in every aspect of their research. And this is true even in the humanities where a lot of faculty at my university are doing text mining and other kinds of digital initiatives. So support for research of this nature, I find, is very fragmented and uneven across the university and across campuses, too. It's completely unsustainable, and there's a plethora of these new research support facilities, core facilities and organized research units to try to deal with this problem. So how does this relate to libraries? Well, libraries, if you think about it, are the er core research facility. Every research university has a library, and every library has a mission of uh, collecting, organizing, managing, preserving, and ensuring long-term long -term access to the products of research and the scholarly record in every discipline. Library, libraries also provide a very important service of um, helping their clients use those resources and uh, providing expert support in, in every discipline to faculty and students. So really, libraries are inseparable from the universities that they're part of and evolve alongside these technological advances and changes to the research and educational modes of their parent institutions. So keep that in mind. As long ago as 1961, uh, people have recognized that the role of libraries is really changing and needs to evolve in the 20th, now 21st century. J.C.R. Lechleiter is a very famous computer scientist and psychologist at MIT who was commissioned by the Association for Research Libraries back in the 50s, late 50s, early 60s to imagine what the world might be like for libraries in the future. 
And he had the insight that, well, once text becomes processable digitally, we're not gonna need the same uh, modes of interacting with them that we've always had. Now, we all still love reading print books, but let's face it, you know, a lot of the use of text today is text mining um, to gain new insights. That's what big data is all about. So as long ago as 61, he kind of recognized that that was coming and that the role of libraries and librarians would have to evolve in order to meet this new way of interacting with scholarly content. And uh, it's taken quite a long time for that vision to kind of come to fruition, but I think we're seeing what he was talking about today. So let's think about libraries. What are their characteristics that we can apply to this problem statement? First of all, they're omnidisciplinary. Every library supports every discipline that is taught or researched at that institution. They're also able to organize and reorganize fairly fluidly compared to academic departments, which are very much informed by the disciplines that they're part of. And those disciplines are pretty hard to change on the fly. And where we see this all the time is with interdisciplinary research that doesn't really fit neatly into a department, but really a set of them who have very different norms and expectations. So what do we do? We create a new research unit or a new core facility to, to bring those people together. But the library has always been omnidisciplinary and agnostic about disciplines and, and how we're organized to support research and teaching. We can also recruit and retain academic staff with specialized research expertise like data science or spatial science and provide those people with paths for recognition and advancement if not tenure. And this is an important point because it can be very hard to recruit people to a university to support new and emerging types of scholarly research if there's really no logical home for them. They get shoehorned into a department where they're really not recognized for what they're doing because they're not doing the core research. They're providing kind of an ancillary service like writing scientific software or something like that. So you hear this plaint all the time from people who are providing very important services at the university but don't have a natural home. Libraries are also central, neutral, and welcoming facilities. And this is very, very important because we're all stretched for space. There is no money for new buildings anymore. So we need to find places to foster interdisciplinary research uh, without having to create new spaces for them all the time. And here is the library that welcomes everybody from every discipline who's doing research and teaching in every mode. So that's kind of an important property. The other thing about libraries is two things to keep in mind. One is they've always been places to centralize expensive shared resources. Those were books originally, but they've evolved over time into things like 3D printers and Keck caves and expensive software like GIS software, where you do not want to be replicating that in every department on campus that might need it. So it's, you know, that role of providing that democratic universal space is an essential function of libraries that has to evolve. We also co-locate researchers and students in a different way. If you walk through this building pretty much any busy time of year, you'll see students and faculty from every discipline in one place. And that doesn't really happen anywhere else except maybe the student union or wherever you eat lunch, you know. So getting people together in an academic space uh, across disciplinary lines is a very rare thing on a university campus. And here we have this place that, you know, everybody knows where it is. They can get together and work here from all different disciplines without having to beg for a conference room from some department. And, you know, so it's, it's sort of naturally this interdisciplinary home for the campus. Some of the things that libraries worry about and have a lot of expertise in that can apply quite broadly to university challenges, credit and attribution. So one of the things academics look for is recognition for what they're doing. And increasingly, that's getting challenging. If you publish a, a peer-reviewed journal article, you're good. But what if you wrote scientific software that's used by thousands of other researchers in your field? Um, or a visualization of some data that is absolutely essential to getting the research across. How do you get credit for that? Libraries are spending a lot of time and effort thinking about that problem and how to adapt the scholarly citation and attribution system to these new forms of research. So an example of that from Davis is a project I have with a senior faculty member in Earth and Planetary Sciences who runs a big computational geophysical, geophysics lab 
They produce lots of software. It's used by thousands of researchers. So we partnered with them to figure out what the citation standards ought to be for the software that they're managing and how to change the scholarly norms in their disciplines so that people do cite that software in the approved way so that they can count it and claim credit for it during promotion and tenure cases and other forms of academic reward. Well, that's just one example. Another thing we do is train students in how to do citation and attribution so we can enculturate these new practices of giving recognition for new forms of scholarship beyond just traditional books and journals. And finally, libraries collect a lot of data that can help the university provide evidence of its impact, both through traditional citation data and altmetrics. So this is something libraries have a lot of expertise in and can really benefit the research goals of the university in uh, helping with things like rankings and just proving that there is impact, um, not just through traditional publishing, but through these other modes of research as well. Researcher networking is something that's coming up a lot. So libraries have a lot of expertise with uh, bibliographic data about publications. And those form the basis for faculty profiles. You know, what have you published over your career? So we're increasingly investing in tools that support uh, the publication of that data. And that provides an interesting way for faculty to be able to network with each other and find expertise that they need. So how many times has there been a call for some very large grant opportunity that requires an interdisciplinary team of 10 or 15 people with very different backgrounds? And how do you find those people? If you don't happen to know already, you know, a biostatistician, these are the kinds of tools that will help you on your campus find those people with the expertise that you need so that you can respond to those calls more efficiently. Um, and finally, open access policies such as the one we have here at the University of California across all of the faculty, um, at least, and others as well, provide um, a reason for us to be collecting this bibliographic data at scale. And I think um, the California Digital Library is doing just that. And you may hear more about it, but in any case, um, this is the kind of system that libraries have a lot of fluency with and could really partner with um, universities to support. Data management. Now, this is something a lot of libraries are doing already, and I, you can't read the words on this, but basically, libraries across the board, mine is a classic example, have a data management program where we support faculty and researchers of all kinds in um, teaching them how to manage data, finding uh, places for them to store and publish that data, techniques for preserving that data over time, we have the technical skills to know how to catalog and organize data, sometimes even integrate it at scale. So as modern data intensive research of all kinds, not just science, requires this kind of effort, we can also leverage each other. Libraries are excellent at networking both in the UC system but also nationally and internationally. So when you're talking about data these days, it's an just unimaginably complex problem, and we're gonna need these kinds of international networks to make headway on this. So preservation is another thing that libraries have expertise in, and this plays out quite a bit in the world of data. Our mission is to acquire, organize, and ensure long-term access to recorded knowledge. We've been exploring these issues since the 1990s. I happened to see Trish Cruz here today, and I remember when she started at the California Digital Library as the head of digital preservation for them. And, you know, that was a long time ago. But, you know, the point is, we've been at this for a long time, and it's not a solved problem, but it's something that libraries have uniquely stepped up to trying to figure out. And not just for traditional modes of scholarship, like books and journals, but all this new digital stuff as well. So if there's gonna be any hope of complying with new federal regulations to keep your data, we're the ones who are gonna be there to help. And now we've got big data. So this is data in the zettabyte and beyond scale. We run the Large Synoptic Sky Telescope Project, LSST, at Davis, and they're generating, oh God, it's like 100 petabytes a day at this point. So the, the quantity of data we're talking about is just, you know, really hard to get your head around. But some, another characteristic of libraries that's important to keep in mind is that we're used to managing very, very large quantities of scholarly information. Those traditionally took the form of books, right? You know, collections of millions and millions and millions of books. But we do have a lot of expertise at thinking about managing and funding 
things at that scale. Training. This is another important thing. At every university, there are all these new skills that we want our students and often our faculty to learn. You know, um, data science is a great example where there are lots and lots of techniques for data science that students and faculty need to learn, but they don't fit neatly into the curriculum that you know, an individual faculty member is beholden to teach. So it's been very hard to figure out how to inject training for these new skills that students desperately need into the traditional curriculum. Here come libraries. So we have existing models of training students and faculty in things like using bibliographic management tools or some whiz new database. And it's been relatively easy to layer on training in things like data science uh, to those kinds of programs. And those can range from a one credit first year seminar to a two week boot camp. And, and there's no harm, no foul. We don't have to work through the academic senate to get permission because these aren't part of the curriculum, but they're a way that the students can get the training they need and we can adapt them very quickly. So when a new tool comes along, you know, a new R library that everybody needs to know about, we can come to the rescue, find the instructor who knows that tool, put together the, the seminar or whatever needs to be done and have that in front of the students in weeks rather than, you know, the Senate process of designing a new class, which can take years. So that's another important characteristic of, of the libraries to keep in mind. And there's that central location, right? Uh, when we do teach these classes, they draw students from all over the university, even other cities sometimes. We have a medical school in Sacramento. Those students all know how to get to the library. So when we teach these classes, they're, you know, they're very well attended because um, it's easy for people to find them. <coughs> So if all of this is so obvious and old hat for libraries, why isn't it happening more? Why isn't it happening at every library, at every university? Well, today, technology and expertise such as I've been describing is distributed across the campus in ways that are usually completely uncoordinated. So you often don't even know how many core facilities you have that have some expertise in something like you know, gene sequencing. We had dozens of them at Davis until we you know, got our act together. Um, so the point is that it, it can be actually hard to know what's already happening on your campus and um, try to coordinate that centrally to even know where to begin. And then the library skill sets do need to expand beyond what has traditionally been taught, which is why a lot of libraries are hiring people in with new expertise. We've done that at Davis. We've hired quite a few people who have PhD backgrounds in a discipline. And they work together with the librarians to put together programs and services um, that everybody kind of brings something unique to. So it's like that interdisciplinary team science, but right in the library. And finally, there's resistance to change. As Elizabeth said, change can be painful. It's usually great for some people and not great for other people. And so it's a balancing act trying to figure out how to do that. And that's really my closing comment, is that the key challenge that I have and that I think other university librarians have who are trying to navigate this is the need to balance supporting traditional modes of research with the new. So we still have a lot of people who depend absolutely on the traditional services of the library, the book collections, the journals, which are almost all online now, but you know, traditional librarian training, classes, and so on. So we have to somehow thread that needle of supporting those services and collections while at the same time increasing the investment in these new opportunities because that's where the university is going. That's where research is going, is in these new, new, new directions, right? So if we don't evolve and adapt to them, the university will suffer. It will not be able to stay as competitive as it could be. But we don't want to disenfranchise the people who still rely on the older ways of doing things. Transitions like this can take decades. We're really just at the beginning. It may have been going on since the 90s or, well, since the internet, basically. I'd say we're in 95 when the web came out as when things just went poof. But, um, this will be going on for another 20 or 30 years. And finally, uh, libraries do and need to collaborate more across campus. I think for a long time, libraries could kind of exist in a silo and everybody knew where they were and knew you know, Elizabeth and all was well. But now, I'm doing a new project at Davis to spin up a research computing initiative 
working very closely with the CIO at our university and the head of the Office of Research. And that we couldn't do it independently. We have to work together to provide a service like that. So we're seeing more and more opportunities for those kinds of collaborations. And again, it's back to that interdisciplinary nature, right? The, the nature of research is evolving. Libraries and the institutions they're part of need to evolve too. And that's mine. So I will turn it over to Gunter. I'll let you do it. It's so rare that you get a PhD as tech support. It's awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. All right, so two things conspired to create this presentation. The first one was that Elizabeth asked me to be inspiring over dinner at a conference. And the second one was that one of my staff members found a cache of um, superhero comics from the 50s that are in the public domain. So this is going to be a little bit different. I'm going to tell you a story of superheroes trying to win the future. And of course superheroes need supervillains and here they are, the 12 risks that threaten our civilization as we know it, as laid out by the Global Challenges Foundation in 2015 in collaboration with Oxford University and an international t um, team of, of researchers. And as you cast your eyes across these challenges, um, you know, you might lightly rest them on the very last one on the bottom right, uh, which is called Future Bad Global Governance, to give you a visceral sense of how much these challenges might already be upon us. Now, as you've taken these in, you might feel like, well, these kinds of challenges really require superheroics from our STEM colleagues. But I would also submit that um, really, in order to tackle these challenges, we need to know a lot about our identity, about our history, about our values, about our beliefs. And so humanities and social sciences superheroes don't feel left out. We need your superpowers to bring to bear on all these challenges as well. You're going to need tools in order to tackle these challenges. And the tools um, need to allow you to share the outcomes of your research efficiently. They also need to allow you to share the underlying data that led you to your conclusions. And the library is your partner in all of this. Uh, the UCSC library here right on campus, the beautiful building we're in right here, um, as well as the system-wide libraries are always looking for a way to partner with faculty, with students, and with each other to uh, find a ways to empower you in this endeavor. Um, that's arguably one of the reasons why we're here today. So I'd encourage you to think of your library as more than just the space. The library is really your partner in shaping and navigating a networked research environment that allows you to go further, faster. And the reason why this point about collaboration is so important to me is that there was one risk in the report that I just cited to you that didn't get a handy dandy graphic and that might actually be the biggest risk to our survival on this planet. And that's the risk that we won't stand together in working on solving all of these challenges. So today I wanna to explore with you two um, sort of randomly picked but important high stake areas where our collective success is dependent on our ability to stand together faculty, students, libraries, as well as libraries with one another. And the first one is a conversation we all have been having for quite a while. Uh, it's been going on for a while, changing the publishing paradigm. Um, and the question here really is, how can we have a high speed, high quality scholarly communications um, mechanism that gives faculty everything that they need while at the same time being affordable to the academy and to the libraries? So take in um, these hand wavy numbers here. They're actually rooted in, in uh, some very factual truths. If you look at the 2016 number here, we spend as a system $94.2 million on licensing um, library materials um, for our faculty and for our students. And if we project a very modest annual increase of 3%, which is way below industry average, um, you can see that in a mere 10 years, that means our costs will balloon by 32 additional million dollars. It's very clear that given the fact that library budgets are flat, that this is unsustainable and that we need to find new modes of behavior in order to chart our path forward. So this is a, this is a great opportunity for us. 
and arguably, the faculty has led the charge here in, in, in terms of policy. In 2013, you passed an open access policy through the Academic Senate that provides a legal framework for all UC faculty to publish their articles in open access. And what I'm showing you here is the implementation of that policy, some of the statistics around that. So in gray, you see uh, manual deposits, uh, faculty across the system depositing their articles manually. In orange, you see the progress we've made through um, a semi-automated pro automated process through a system, a publications management system that the California Digital Library runs that uh, allows you to claim your publications and upload them. And you can see we've collected since the policy was passed 45,000 articles. That's really important. So we've got a policy that inspires other uh, campuses to pass similar policies and we're gathering up um, publications and making them openly available which will uh, inspire others to do the same. And in that way, uh, we are taking a great step towards a little bit more independence from publishers. Now, I think it'll be important for libraries, faculty, students to continue to stand together um, in pushing for open access. And you might say, well, you know, Gunter, that's all happening a little bit more in the STEM fields, and that's where the push is really strong and where the culture is really strong. And yes, I, I recognize that, but I'd also submit to you that um, in almost every discipline, uh, there now is something that's at least worth investigating some mechanism that's available to you that's worth looking at. And I have two examples for you, the Open Library of the Humanities, where you can publish open access free of charge, and a really interesting program by our very own University of California Press called Luminous, uh, which focuses on publishing open access monographs. And I've <coughs> pulled one out here that has a UCSC co-author. So if you're not able to publish natively in OA, we understand. However, there's one path that's always open to you, and that is the open access policy. You can exercise your right, power, and obligation um, under that policy. And here I'm showing you an email that um, you might have seen uh, that asks you to claim your article that falls under, a, under the policy and to upload your author's copy. And I just want to be very clear here. The, your library doesn't send you these emails to annoy you. Your library sends you these emails because this is a really important way for us to make sure that you use your superpower in making scholarly communications more effective and more affordable by making these articles freely available. And it has big impact. If you're looking at this map here, this shows uh, the, the uh, global reach now of UC scholarship based on these open access articles, which were downloaded one million times since uh, the <coughs> open access policy was passed. So think of this as us vastly increasing our mind share and uh, your ability to find other superheroes who work on similar challenges to, one, to the ones you're working on. To boot, research also shows that if you publish in open access, uh, your citations will go up as well. So this is really a win-win all around. Now, the libraries are also standing with you and are international leaders in investigating transformative new models to publishing. Um, some of our libraries are among the first signatories to an international initiative called OA 2020, which basically says that we should um, leverage our subscription funding into viable open access publishing models. And others among our libraries are leaders uh, in the Association of Research Libraries community pushing for a model called Red OA, which um, wants to investigate whether we can, um, whether we can turn preprint servers such as X-Archive into fully fledged publishers. And at the end of the day, any of these strands of investigation into a more viable model, really they all have in common that we're looking to create an environment in which we can turn off the big deals with the big publishers without harming your ability to do your research and to share your findings. And that's ultimately uh, the goal here and I think the logical next step in deepening the UC's commitment to open access um, that empowers both the faculty as well as the libraries. So the second story I want to share with you is about research data and builds very nicely on what Mackenzie sh shared with you. Remember those big challenges you were all going to solve for us? Well. 
we need free and open publications to win that future, and I would submit we also need free and open data. And the reason for that is twofold. First reason is speed. Academics need access to each other's data to be able to get to their conclusions, cures, and analysis faster. That's why Joe Biden's Cancer Moonshot Initiative basically said, well, if we want to make progress on cancer faster, um, open data is one of the pillars of making that happen. And basically the same message is coming out of the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, which is, has as, as its stated goal to eradicate all disease within the century. Nothing like a good lofty goal to get you motivated. <laughs> So um, the second challenge I want to talk to you about is quality. We don't just want things to happen faster, obviously. We also want them to be credible. And I'm sure you're all painfully aware that credibility is a big, big political issue these days. And I would also say that it's um, an issue in how some, of, uh, some research is being documented. Open data enables researchers to show their work and to be more transparent in their research and enable others to validate studies. So that really is key in building trust. And I have a, a, an illuminating example for you today here. Um, this is a study that looked at 53 papers that uh, substantiated the efficacy of a, of a certain drug. And the authors looked at those 53 papers and tried to correlate uh, the underlying data for those studies with the findings in the papers. And what they found was that only for six papers could they correlate the data and the findings. So there were 47 papers where that direct line just didn't exist. Uh, so that's not great news for science, I submit. But the good news here is that because the data was available, somebody could actually go in and in a very transparent fashion do this investigation and ensure that the cream, so to speak, rose to the top. Um, to add in insult to injury here, sorry, and this cut off a little bit here, the paper with the unconfirmed findings were actually the ones that were cited uh, more heavily than the ones with the confirmed findings. So a lot to ponder here. So this kind of open uh, data um, idea is no longer just a good thing to do, or luxury, it's of course also something, as you're all aware, that your funders are now mandating you to do. And it's becoming part of the very fabric of how research happens, which begs the question of how do we best empower faculty to respond to that and how do you actually open up your data? And here I'll make a shameless plug for your UC Santa Cruz library and I'll show their research data management homepage, uh, which is a great example of how libraries serve uh, their communities when new requirements arise and when we have core expertise to bear on those requirements. It's also a beautiful ex example of how we collaborate across the system. Some of the services and some of the tools you see up here are provided by uh, the California Digital Library, for example, Dash, which is a, uh, a data publication service, or uh, on the bottom left, Merit, which is a long-term digital preservation repository, and the library is now bundling up all these things on offer within the system as well as nationally and internationally and bringing them to you um, and helping you navigate this very, very complex landscape of data management. So I would say run, don't walk to your library when you have questions about how to meet these requirements and need help with that. Um, it's a, it's, a, it's a, a great place and a great way to partner. Now, of course, re, um, research data has also been in the news for, um, for less fortunate reasons um, because scientists across the nation got very concerned about the long-term preservation of federal research data. And that makes a lot of sense. We're basically trying to build a system where you are sharing your research data so others can take advantage of it and you need access to other people's data so you can take advantage of it. And a very, very important cache of that data is federal research data. And by the way, again, this isn't just critical for the kinds of things that got the big attention to in the headlines, uh, climate change data and so on and so forth. There's a huge treasure trove of educational data, voters' rights data, affirmative action data, and so on and so forth uh, that sits within the federal government. So we, we all collectively, I think, have a huge vested interest here. And so what did faculty do when this news broke, um, you organized and you participated in data refuge events all across the nation and within the UC. 
and your library, again, is right in there with you, now thinking very hard about how to build on these data refuge events uh, to create a national infrastructure that can safeguard uh, federal research data. Um, and one of the very uh, concrete steps here was that in, uh, in uh, earlier in May, a broad coalition of researchers, libraries, archivists, funders, journalists, technologists met in Washington, D.C. to come together and scope out what an initiative like that might look like. Um, and he here is um, one of the ways to frame that, um, the Libraries Plus Network is envisioned as an open coalition of partners to target, safeguard, and steward high-value at-risk data for long-term discovery and use. And the UC libraries, again, are part of this conversation and leaders in this conversation. This flip chart, actually, Mackenzie tells me, was in her handwriting. Right, Mackenzie, that's you. Nice penmanship there. Um, um, Mackenzie was participating in that meeting. Um, um, and the California Digital Library at the meeting presented on a prototype for how to mirror federal research data and how one very practical approach to this might pan out. So I'll end by saying that, you know, I've tried to be inspiring, but I also have to be honest with you, this is a somewhat terrifying moment in our, in our nation's history. Um, and at the same time, it's also the magic moment of the title of my presentation. It's magic because it allows us to find our power in joint action. And I think we can seize this magic moment to reaffirm that open publications and open data are the fertile soil for credible approaches to the most challenging societal problems, which I framed very broadly in my second slide as these big risks, but you know they include problems uh, we've we solve for our local communities as well as for the nation. They come in all kinds of different shapes and guises. So if I have one message for you today, it's this. For every article, for every book, for every data set, you publish open access. The collective superpower of the world gets stronger, and our collective path forward illuminates. So let's seize the moment. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for being here. What, uh, my remarks are going to overlap a fair bit, uh, both Gunter's and, but especially Mackenzie's remarks, and that shouldn't be surprising because I'm speaking about education, and of course, at universities, research and education are the two faces of Janus, the god, and uh, there's much in common when we think about uh, the two parts of our core mission. We do many things to support learning and education in libraries, of course. I'm going to focus today just on one aspect, which is learning spaces to support connected learning. Societies at the dawn of a new age of discovery, and actually both of the previous speakers also remarked on this. Uh, it's something that we all have to pay attention to. Excuse me, just one second. I need to adjust something here. We're seeing a remarkable blossoming of nanoscience, genomics, artificial intelligence, biomedicine, electronics, in part because of an explosive growth in information resources and radically improving technology to work with the world's knowledge. Um, as we learn to harness the power of technology to generate and analyze information in new ways, discovery is going to accelerate in other areas as well. For instance, in digital literary criticism, in far reading of massive volumes of text, uh, art, imagine doing art history with, when you have access to 3D images at human vision resolution of all of the world's uh, art objects available to you from your uh, classroom, your office, or your living room. Information resources, more than ever, are growing explosively, but as a result, they're less organized, there's less vetting for reliability, uh, and there are more media and channels through which they flow. We need to help our students thrive in this age of remarkable abundance combined with remarkable complexity and great uncertainty about value and quality. Technology is necessary 
for using information to discover. We need the technology to work with all this information. And this is more types of technology. It's not just the book, the quill pen, and the parchment sheet anymore. Our students need to adapt to the fact that new types of technology are arriving rapidly. And they're more complex to use effectively. We have new ways of learning and problem solving. Not really. These are old ways, but they're new ways that are more feasible and are enabled by changes in technology and information resources. And collaborative and cooperative learning and team learning and problem solving are one of the primary examples of that. I'm going to talk a fair bit about that. Our students arrive on campus with varied experience and skills in the information age. What they know is constantly outdated. Indeed, what we know is constantly outdated. It's a world that's changing faster than we can keep up with, and we have to learn to adapt at that speed. And students don't really know what's possible. They don't know what technologies can be used for their particular passions. They don't know what passions of, might be ignited when they become aware of what information resources they can tap into. So we need on campuses gateway discovery spaces places with great information resources and the expertise to support finding, evaluating, and using those resources, places with opportunities to try varied and newly emerging information technologies to work with those information resources, and places to connect our classrooms, our project spaces, and our inquiry passions with peers to work together and collaborate. A building of books no longer is enough. As wonderful as they are and as much as we will preserve them and as important as they are to any research institution. We know that book circulation is down, but the use of information, of course, is up. Students freely roam the information landscape, but they're mixing curated and in the wild collections and often not knowing which is which. We know that writing an essay or a problem set is a shrinking fraction of students' homework and work engagement at universities. We know that much team learning is mandated and essential for success. We know a building to provide books supports only a small fraction of what students are doing in their learning experiences. So if that's the problem, how do we get to where we want to be? We need to know what types of learning support our students need to succeed in this world of vastly increasing and explosively changing information and information technologies. We know that faculty are teaching differently. We know that students are learning differently. What we want to know is how we can support them. We can do that if we take a user-centered design approach. We need to find out what our learners need to thrive in this new learning landscape and then help provide it for them. And that's a constant process. It's not a one-shot thing because the environment in which we learn and do our research is constantly changing and we have to be constantly adapting. We have to embrace change and be constantly seeking to learn what it is that our students need from us. I'm going to talk for the rest of my time about connected learning and the nature of learning in a connected environment and what students need to learn in that environment, what we know, but not so much what we know, but what we need to learn about ourselves. Generally, students need to connect simultaneously with people, information, and technology to succeed in the information age. They need information resources, not just in the building, but from across the world. They need collaborators locally and remotely. They need technologies to find, evaluate, use that information and communicate their ideas, and they need experts to assist and guide them in the use of these technologies and resources. Connected learning is way more than simply changing the way we teach in the classroom. That's part of it, but it's a very small part of modern education. I'm going to say a few words about each of these elements. The theory of active and engaged learning and connected learning is not new. Uh, as a theory, it actually goes back at least to Rousseau and to other philosophers, and especially John Dewey, who wrote a book about it and, and wrote about much in his career, but in particular his 1933 book, How We Think. Quoting Marilyn Page, Dewey described the mind as a verb, as something to do rather than something to be filled like a sponge. Every student should be involved in lively activity around a project. 
to really learn higher levels of thinking, critical thinking and evaluative thinking, to learn analysis, synthesis, and evaluation, you need to experience it. You need to engage with it, not hear about it. This is best done through problem solving, discovery and creative experiences, collaboration, and iteration. There's now extensive research in hundreds of studies across education science, social psychology, and other fields that have established that active, collaborative, problem-based learning is more effective than other approaches. What do students need for that? They need spaces and resources. They need access to a wide variety of high quality information resources. No surprise there, we're in that business. But they also need to experience emerging advanced information technologies to work with those resources. They need to learn, they need these technologies to learn about the world, to make observations, to analyze, to synthesize and communicate ideas. But they also need to learn about the technologies, to understand what is possible and to get used to functioning with a constantly improving array of tools. For some years in the 2000s, it was a common mistake to think that students were arriving as, quote, digital natives and they knew all they needed to know about technology already when they got to campus. I think we've all gotten past that now and recognized that although every student may have a smartphone in their pocket and know how to text and do many things with it, they don't know what most of the emerging technologies are. We don't either because they're changing so fast and they're coming forward so fast. And we need to open their eyes to blow their minds with the possibilities that are created by this intersection between information and information technology. They also need places. They need places where they can connect to those resources, both information and technological, and where they can connect with their collaborators as connected learning is a team sport. Libraries can provide these spaces these spaces to bring together access to information, technology, and people. We have spaces. We have places where people gather. As Mackenzie pointed out, we tend to be in the centers of campus and we're open to everybody. We're omnidisciplinary. We are embracing and we are a crossroads for people. These spaces are intended for student learning activities, learning and research. So they, it's consistent with the mission. The spaces are there. We have high quality information resources and expertise. Now all students today have access to free content on the internet, which is an enormous amount of information. But that's the free content. We provide the access to materials worth billions that are not free on the internet, many of which aren't even on the internet yet. As Gunter mentioned, the UC system spends over $90 million a year just to provide digital access to scholarly materials, mostly journals, licensed materials. Without spending that money, our students and faculty wouldn't have access to them. Without mentioning Sci-Hub. We also have a trained core of information professionals dedicated to serving students. And we've started providing technology. I'm going to say we've just started. Libraries were in the forefront of providing computers and then internet connections. But we're only recently starting to broaden our concept of shared access to emerging information technologies. Some libraries are now providing maker spaces to apply technology to information and materials. Some might check out high definition video cameras and other types of technological devices. Some provide uh, a, data, a data wall for visualization. I think what we need to do is reframe our sense of what providing access is to the discovery gateway for new information technologies as well as information content. The two go inextricably together and indeed always have. After all, books are a technology. They're an extension of human organic capabilities. We need to bring in virtual reality production and use. Sorry, that's falling over here, excuse me. Virtual reality is not just to use for gaming or pornography. It's something to use for simulation, for instruction, for exploring the environment around us. And our students should not only be learning how to use it, but how to create with it. We need video VR creation laboratories for them to discover what's possible in that environment. We need data visualization walls. We need GIS sys tools to work with text, with social network data, and other types of digital humanities and social science information. We need multimedia production suites so that our information literacy training can go not to just bringing the information in, in to the reading part of literacy, but to the writing or communicating part of literacy so that our students can learn to communicate in a multimedia world. 
In summary, libraries can provide the spaces our learners need with access to information, technology, and people, whereas coffee shops don't. I'm sure many of you have heard the question, aren't you just talking about providing what the coffee shops and the student union already provides? But no, those spaces are costly. You actually need to occasionally buy something or they wouldn't pay their rent, and that's why the coffee is so expensive. They're limited flexibility space. They're configured in a particular way. They provide access to free internet content, sure, free Wi-Fi, and if students use the VPN, they can even get access to campus licensed resources but not to the books, maps, videos, prints, photos, letters, business records, and other resources that we provide on campus. These other public spaces don't provide the consultants or the mentors, the experts to help people navigate and explore this discovery space. Nor do they provide shared collections of expensive emerging technologies. We have something to offer that the other public spaces on and around campuses don't. I want to close by remarking that this is not radical. This is not a change. Indeed, the Chancellor set up my remarks here. Uh, I also wanted to point out we've been doing this for 4,000 years. Libraries, sorry, documented facts and shared theories of how the world works have always been the seed corn for discovery. One of the very first knowledge technologies was the written word. Writing is a technology. It's not organic. It doesn't emerge out of evolution, it emerged, well, it does in some sense, but it's an extension of human capability. The book is a technology. Actually, let's go back to stone tablets. They were a technology. Stone tablets, scrolls, and books were scarce and expensive. For most of these 4,000 years, they were created by hand, by hand copying and hand generation. So libraries were created to buy expensive information resources and technologies, the books and the stone tablets, and to share them. People couldn't afford to have a complete collection of their own. And so we created libraries as providers of public goods, access to information, technology, and information resources. Buying expensive information resources and technology and sharing them to stimulate discovery has been our mission for 4,000 years. That's not a change. We can learn the expanded needs of connected learners. We won't be able to always be in front of it. We won't be able to keep up with it because things are changing constantly in a world of information revolution. But we can draw on a long history of research on active and now increasingly research on connected learning. We can also follow modern practices of user-centered design. Do user research. Find out. Go out and find out how our students are learning. Learn what they need to know to learn and figure out what supported those who thrived and succeeded. And then we can take this reformulation of our mission, this notion that part of our education mission and supporting education is to provide connected learning spaces and make that part of our plan and start using that to make our decisions. Create a plan that will realize this mission to support our connected learners and prioritize. For example, in, at the Berkeley Library, our new strategic plan of our four strategic directions, the second one is to help develop emerging areas and modes of scholarship and one of our key tactics is to design, adapt, and maintain a range of physical spaces to support students, including those engaged in collaborative and connected learning. With that commitment, we now use that to make decisions about our resources, our activities, set our priorities. It's affecting our fundraising plans, our hiring of new librarians, our reconfiguration of our large and our small spaces. We can do this, and I want to give you a little bit of a uh, sense of what we're planning at Berkeley with a short video. challenges that I faced in terms of academics here was finding the correct resources and the correct people to talk to. One of the biggest problems for me and I think a lot of my peers has been navigating all the information that we have. I remember walking into Doe Library my freshman year and seeing a big sign that says, have a question, ask a librarian. My initial response was, that's great, I haven't a clue what kind of question I would ask. Students coming into college don't know what they don't know. And part of the excitement of our learning is that kind of discovery about what is possible, what they can find out about, what they can contribute to. But it's scary. And of course, if you don't know what you don't know, you need to start somewhere. This is a big campus, and students who come here can be a bit overwhelmed. 
Berkeley has many, many bright undergraduate students, but the downside to having such a large campus is that it's difficult to have chance encounters with other undergraduates who have similar interests when there's no central location. All the students that I've talked to tell me how hard it is to really know what's available to them and how to make it work for them. And often they tell me they figure it out when they're seniors. So what we're trying to do is create a space that actually helps make that all make sense much earlier in a student's career. So they can really treat Moffitt like a space to get exposed to what's all possible. The library is the discovery place. It's the place that enables people to open their eyes to things they never knew existed before. Having the kinds of spaces that uh, students can learn how to use the tools to become creators of information as well as analyzers or critics of that information, I think is what's really going to prepare them for a new century. We recently finished renovating the fourth and fifth floors of Moffitt. We have floors one, two, and three to go. We need to create spaces that are rich with innovation studios and laboratories, maker spaces, multimedia production studios, virtual reality creation labs, the types of facilities that will enable students to explore the world around them through information resources and information technology. We're hoping to have class spaces where students are working with other students and with their instructor and actual taking a class and seeing lectures and using media and other kinds of course resources. And then when they leave that classroom that they're already in the library space that they can do all these other things. As we've developed the big idea course that, that we've been working on, this course in scientific style critical thinking, we found that we were constantly in a position of trying to find a classroom space that was suitable for this kind of highly interactive course with a lot of group activity. And there aren't that many spots on campus. We're trying to create in the Center for Connected Learning a space on campus that enables that connection between classroom studio, innovation laboratory, collaborative workspace, so students can experience the type of active, engaged learning that we know works best for them. It's a place where people can come to work together and a place where people can collaborate from different parts of campus. It's just more of a less traditional space that really embraces who students are and how far we've come and the humanity that comes with studying at this institution. I've heard some other people on campus describe Moffitt Library as a collider space, and I really love that idea, mostly because it gives us really active notion to the idea that we're bringing together all the main parts of the university's mission. Elsewhere on campus, we have studios and labs for students, but they're in particular departments, and in engineering, you're only going to work with engineering students. In anthropology, you're going to work with the anthropology students. At the library, you have this collision of all of the disciplines and all of the ideas and all of the different questions. Bringing it all in one space, I think, helps kind of take this very large campus and make it make sense for students. In a lot of ways, there are synergies that'll happen just by having all those parts together that wouldn't be the same if you were just moving to different buildings across campus and finding each part on its own. Floors four and five are just the beginning. They scratch the surface, but they've opened people's eyes to what's possible. This is the type of thing that can transform the education of undergraduates at Berkeley and enable them to continue to be the leaders of the world in the future. So, where are we today? We all know that a pile of books isn't enough, as important as it is. What we want to know is what we can do to support our students in the learning that they'll be doing in the information age. We can get there, but we need to focus our attention on learning what they need and finding out and being adaptive to change constantly in that and then providing it to them. Thanks. So um, we're happy to take questions and have a discussion. We're going to put the um, microphone in the middle here. But really, this is a lot of information from different perspectives. And I think it's important to think about what does that make you think about on this campus? A campus, for example, that doesn't have a student union. I don't know if you all know that, but we don't have a student union. So the library serves you know, as a real social space as well as a uh, a connected learning space, a place to access various types of information. 
So, um, she's, oh, she's just going to pass it around. Okay, this is for you. I have a, this is, of course, extremely interesting uh, talks, and uh, I learned a lot. But one of the things I would like to ask any of you to respond to is, there was very little talk about where the faculty who is teaching students and presumably knows the best what students need to learn, where do they come in? How do you interact with faculty? Could any one of you respond to that? Uh, every day by talking to them and working with them, of course. I mean, we, we have a deep partnership, and must be with the faculty on a university campus. I mean, there's no question about that. When I said that librarians need to learn what the students need, one of the main avenues for that is working with the faculty. But of course, the faculty also need, need to learn what the students need because that's changing. So we all need to do that together. But uh, all of our librarians are uh, assigned as liaisons to different departments and faculty. So every department has its liaison librarian, and they go to department meetings and work with them very closely. Yeah, and I would say from the research perspective, it's the faculty who are coming to me to say, you know, I have a problem, I need your help. And so I have partnerships with a dozen faculty right now doing research projects with them to solve problems that they have that aren't part of their own personal research but are affecting their ability to be effective and get credit for what they're doing. So um, it, it's important for the library to signal to everyone what it's capable of and what it's interested in and can support. But yeah, I think I also have interactions with faculty on a daily basis um, around these issues. And of course, they have a lot of different opinions about what our priorities should be. But that's where the Senate comes in and you know the campus administration. And so we, we try to triage across the entire university because everyone has an interest and a stake in how the library functions and what it's doing, right? It's, it's hard sometimes to get your head around how many stakeholders we have to interact with. And the faculty are certainly probably the most important, but students, you know, that's, that's why we're all here at the end of the day. So it's a balancing act. So, um, I wanted to actually, my next? <laughs> Only microphone. <laughs> microphone. <laughs> By default. It's called the talking and stick. And yeah. introduce yourselves as well. Uh, I'm Tyrus Miller. I'm uh, Vice Provost and Dean of Graduate Studies. Um, I was interested in a couple of the points. Um, they're, they're also really to the point of the library's interaction as a, as a research entity and as a support for research with other uh, entities and, and people on campus. Um, there was the point about collecting uh, data to provide evidence of research impact, and I w was wanting to just get some examples of that. Um, and a related question, which is about data management, which of course has become really you know, a, a crucial area of grant application and grant uh, management and so forth. So uh, more generally, I think of both the, met the metrics and the data for impact and also data management as being the, the front line of that, tending to be in the Office of Research. And I was curious about your interactions uh, with, with them and ways in which there can be a mutually supportive relationship between yeah. research and the library. So I'll, I'll take that first. Um, and you're right, it, except it varies so much from university to university what the Office of Research focuses on and what the library focuses on. And on the Davis campus, um, the Office of Research has really, you know, struggled with a lot of the compliance demands that they have to deal with now that, you know, don't get better from year to year, they get worse. So they, I think, are grateful that we can work with them on this problem because we have this shared need to be able to document what researchers are doing, um, both for promoting what the university's impact is and also for helping with compliance, to be quite honest. So you can solve two problems with one technology there. And because the library has the expertise with the bibliographic data and other kinds of data now, like software citations, data citations, and so on, um, I'm pointing to her because she runs Datacite, which is an organization that specializes in 
how to cite data. So we're, we're tracking all that in, involved day to day with publishers and information companies and, and systems that handle this. And the Office of Research is oblivious to all that, right? So, so it's a great partnership to kind of provide that knowledge about data and metadata and then their knowledge of what the campus is trying to track and what it needs to document, right? So um, that and then also the data management. At, at Davis, the Office of Research doesn't run research computing or, or data science. I know that at Michigan, they do, but you know, it's different everywhere. And so there was a really big gap on my campus, which the Office of Research didn't have the resources to fill. But between IT and the library and the Office of Research, we've come up with a solution. And I wouldn't say it would translate perfectly to another university, but I do think we're all in agreement that we can't go alone. So unless the university already has an Office of Research that has done this for years, um, it's kind of an opportunity to rethink the roles of different parts of the university. Does that help? Okay. Hello, I'm Pamela Roby, an emerita professor of sociology here at UCSC. And I apologize, Jeffrey, if I did not hear you say this and you said it. But I'm thinking with all the renovation of floors three and four of Moffat, how many volumes were there in Moffat before the renovation and how many are there now and how many do you see being in Moffat after the other floors are renovated. Sure. Because I, I very much appreciate and use the new technology, but I also appreciate and use books. Yeah, of course. Um, we've got, you know, we're, we're a big uh, campus, an old campus, and we're very fortunate to have 25 libraries. Moffitt is one of them. Uh, it had a collection of about 200,000 books. There was the so-called undergraduate collection. Uh, they were very heavily duplicative of other uh, copies of books on campus. Um, and uh, they were also our, were the undergraduate reserve collection. The undergraduate reserve collection is still there. The other books have all been moved. Um, more, about 60% of them have been moved about 100 yards away. Our main stacks are connected to Moffitt. Uh, they're underground between Moffitt and our Doe Library, for those of you who know our campus. So it's basically the same building. It's just moved uh, next door, about 60% of them there. Uh, and the other 40% were largely moved as about, now 50% of our total collection has been moved to the Richmond facility that we all use for off-campus storage, um, the, the system shares. So the other books were there. And a very small fraction of duplicates that weren't in use anymore were uh, given away. Uh, I can't remember if they were, I, this was before I got there, so I can't remember if they were sold or given, but I think they were given away. Uh, none were destroyed, as, as I recall. Um, so, th so the building now, one of our 25 libraries, is not a book building. It is a, book bu it is a connected learning space, uh, except for the undergraduate reserve collection, which is still there. Um, and that's part of our portfolio. Uh, we don't have everything in every single building. We don't have connected learning spaces in all of our other libraries. Uh, we have some. Our business library now, our engineering library, um, have spaces like this as well on a smaller scale. But it's a, it's a portfolio of things to serve all of the needs of our students and faculty. Yeah, I'm Paul Koch. I'm the Dean of Physical and Biological Sciences. Um, I have a question kind of related to the first question you got, which was about, um, not just about the, how the faculty connect on the, the learning, but our, how, how data and knowledge drives what you're doing. And this could go to any of you, but, but Jeffrey, you were most focused, I think, on the undergrad, on the education mission. So is your ed school involved? Um, you know, how, is, how, how are those data playing into what you you actually um, make happen with respect to uh, space? I'll start you yeah. finding something to say too. Um, not enough, to be honest. Uh, there's a you know, tradition in uh, institutional entities of doing informal research, uh, and that's true, I think, in libraries historically as well. Uh, we're trying to change that. There was a lot of work done for the, the renovation of the, the two floors of Moffat, four and five, which was a major renovation. There was a lot of uh, field work done on trying to, we, we did uh, a lot of work with the student government as a representative body. Uh, they uh, designed a few of the rooms and helped us set priorities, worked with the academic senate to find out uh, uh, with faculty, with the senate committee, and also with focus groups of faculty. But it was informal, uh, and there wasn't a lot of reliance on uh, modern learning in education science or in social psychology. There was some, 
but we're moving towards more of that now and we're trying to uh, adapt to that, in particular to build a user research team that actually uses formal methods of user experience research to try to understand learning in the field in situ on, on our campus, in the case of our classrooms, rather than just the more informal qualitative methods. And there's nothing wrong with the informal qualitative methods, but we could do a lot better with more data and more uh, rigorous research on that. So we're, we're, we're moving in that direction. Many universities have a Center for Educational Technology and Learning or Teaching and Excellence or something like that. And we've been working very closely with them at Davis and in fact partnering with instructional designers that work for them on designing these new classes. We have a one credit first year seminar in research methods that's jointly taught by a faculty member and the library staff. Um, and that was designed with a professional instructional designer that came from this Center for Education and or Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning. So I think, I think you start to see those synergies. It's another example of where we're partnering across campus to try to do this. And the, the classes we're offering are all demand driven. You know, they're things that people have been begging us or somebody to step up to offering because they don't, they're not part of the normal curriculum, right? Like research methods for an undergraduate. That nobody teaches that now. Uh, hi. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I'm assistant Pro Kyle Perry, assistant professor in history and art and visual culture. Um, I was curious to hear any comments on the commercial dimension of all of these things, the profit dimension, the capital dimension, because the conversation's happening in a public university, and I think about the fact that basically every week I get a new email from a startup or something that wants me to integrate a new she whiz technology into my classroom, yeah. and they're kind of trying to make their way into UC Stedekers through faculty. You know, I teach in areas that are digital culture and so forth, so it seems like a good fit for these people, although I think these are also just mass emails that they send out. Mm -hmm. So I just refuse or ignore or whatever. I don't go into critique. But I'm curious about this as a dimension because you know, Google thinks of itself as a superhero, right? That is going to rescue, uh, you know, uh, that will solve the problem of digital preservation or that will solve problems yeah. of um, the distribution of research, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm just curious about existing kind of perspective that you have now on pushing back on the potential for commercial entities to take over when we are in precarious positions in public universities, whether it's in teaching or in research. Um, also just how we form language for this as we go forward as a public university that values um, not-for-profit spaces like libraries and, and, the, and the values built into that. Jeff's thinking, so I'll start. So uh, you're asking a couple of different questions, yeah. and one is about um, the value of some of these commercial offerings to us, and how do you sort out which ones are valuable when you're just besieged with new ones? There's a new one every day, you know, and so that's one problem. Um, and then the other is the, the ones that you sort of identify as potentially key to your, whatever it is you're doing, teaching or doing research like Google. And you know, in the former, I think um, that that is a problem that we struggle with in lots of areas. It's certainly true in publishing, for example. I don't know how many of you get email from the so-called predatory journals on a daily basis, um, right? And so that's just kind of a fact of the networked world that we have to get used to: is this barrage of product offerings and requests for your time and attention and. I, I don't really have a good solution for that, except that we, one of the things libraries do is sort through product offerings and try to kind of prioritize or assess them. We've always done that for databases and scholarly resources. We're increasingly doing it for tools like GIS data or GIS software and that kind of thing. So, so to a limited extent, I think we could help with that. Um, the other is the partnerships. And there, my philosophy is really you know, trust but verify. Right? We cannot do this alone, as Gunter said in his talk. We need the corporate partners, but you know, they have different motives and incentives than we do, so we have to make sure we're in charge of those relationships and not them. Right? And this is true for Microsoft and Google, and it's true for Elsevier and Wiley. You know, it's, we need to stay in charge and understand what we're trying to accomplish and dictate the terms of those relationships, but we, we can't really compete with them, that is an arms race we will lose. So, you know, it, I think that's a very important topic. And particularly when we're talking about data, like university data, we need to be deciding who can have it, 
under what terms and conditions, and not just giving it to them by default. And with educational tools, that's a huge problem, right? I think it was Jen Stringer at Berkeley, actually, who started this movement on principles for data sharing and education <coughs> so that we're mindful about what we're sitting on and who we're giving it to and what they can do with it. So that's my best answer. And just to build on that string with uh, Jen Stringer from Berkeley, who's, who's working on these data sharing best practices, one of the things that was very interesting to me about that is that when you as faculty get approached about using a commercial product, um, often it's completely free to you to use because the business model is to sell the underlying clickstream and the underlying data that gets generated by you using it, your students using it, and to then leverage that. So I, I think an important piece of that, uh, when you directly get approached, is to just really make sure you understand the business model, the underlying business model, because you might be buying into something or providing them with something to sell that you had no intention of providing them to sell. So that was one of my big takeaways there from that conversation. I don't have much because I'm uh, basically going to play off of some things that Mackenzie already said, but I want to give a couple of examples. For, first, of course, we can't do without for-profit production. Uh, that's the way our society is organized, and we would libraries would not be very far today if we weren't buying our books from for-profit publishers and if we weren't buying machines from Apple and IBM and so forth. The question is how we do it, and one of the things that we as economists look for is issues of lock-in and whether or not we're getting tied into a system so that we are essentially granting that provider monopoly power over us, which they can then exploit. So in looking to partnerships with corporations, you look to do things in a way that doesn't lock you into them. An important way these days, as both Mackenzie and Gunter said, is to be very concerned about the control of data. And I'm not going to repeat their points that we have to pay attention. Let me just give a couple of examples where we've seen this done right and are really great models. Uh, one is the Hathi Trust, uh, which is the consortium of universities that was established when the Google Books project was established in, in partnership with universities so that the original contracts of the Google Books projects were, yes, you can scan our books, but you have to give us a, our own digital copy of the file. You have to give it all back to us because you were scanning our books so that we're no longer dependent on Google for those images. We have them in the Hathi Trust and they belong to us. We didn't give up any of that and we, we got something, some added value back. Another example, a recent consortium called Unison among the variety of universities, which is built largely around learning management systems and they've adopted Canvas as their learning management system, a for-profit tool. But the Unison, anybody who belongs to Unison and uses Canvas through that, owns all of the data that is generated by the students on the, and faculty on their campus. So all of this learning data is owned by the campus, not by the corporation. Um, another example from my prior employer, uh, Michigan was one of the first four universities to join the Coursera uh, MOOC uh, uh, consortium and set as a condition of that contract that all of the data, all of the clickstream data, all of the information about Michigan about students taking Michigan courses, not Michigan students, but students taking Michigan courses, was owned by the university and had to be turned over to the university. So again, we have control of all that data and have access to it. So those are three examples of the types of things we need to look for in all of our partnerships going forward. Michael Cowan, I'm a retired intellectual and cultural historian. Uh, I've got a kind of meta research uh, a question uh, that is, research on learning, research, and communication. Um, four terms that I heard that I thought were very interesting and relatable. One was collision, collision of people, ideas, spontane spontaneity, serendipity, uh, and interdisciplinary. Um, the, I noticed in the last presentation, all the examples, uh, the people talking were from the STEM areas. And um, I found myself interested in the question of whether as a physical space, and how, what kind of research on the actual learning, spontaneity, uh, spontaneity uh, serendipity, can, that occurs in those spaces that is not already per, uh, institutionalized. One can see how, for example, bringing a seminar or a small work group into that space, and that group 
interacts with each other. And all sorts of interesting sparks can fly, collisions can take place, serendipity can happen, and so forth. What kind of research, and it comes back to this issue, is there on people spontaneously interacting in ways that are not uh, priorly structured? Uh, and to what extent do you have any specific examples of interactions that take place across disciplinary lines that are not merely within the STEM areas or within, say, quantitatively uh, associated uh, fields? I've got a good example of each, if I can remember them long enough. Uh, in the first case, uh, this is sort of a trivial example, but the, the spontaneity that wasn't sort of prearranged when you have um, spaces that are c quite open and people are doing things in them, it, it attracts interest from people who are walking by. So I kind of think of it as um, stack browsing with people instead of books, right? So I've seen this happening where there's a, a, a seminar going on, something interesting is displayed on the screen a faculty member is you know, passionately talking about their research to a group of students, and kids who are just walking by to find a place to sit down and study will wander in and listen for a while because they're just curious, right? That doesn't happen very often in the sort of classical classroom buildings. It could, but I, for whatever reason, it seems to happen more in these kind of shared spaces like the library. The second is um, where different disciplines come together in very unexpected ways. And the best example I can think of is that my library hosts our campus data science initiative. I'm the lead dean for that. And we have weekly seminars where somebody will just come and describe a problem they have that, that they haven't been able to kind of crack. And lots of people come from lots of disciplines and there was a really interesting one uh, where an English professor was trying to do something with, with text mining and a plant biologist who had come that day knew a technique that was exactly what they were looking for. And that person was a graduate student. So, you know, it, it was just a miracle. But this is where team science ought to be going, is bringing English faculty with certain expertise together with STEM faculty with different expertise to see where there is undiscovered common knowledge. Right? This is Karl Popper used to talk about this in you know, what the 60s. But we're only now finding the, the ways to actually exploit it. But I've seen it happen. Hi, I'm Richard Montgomery, Mathematics. I have uh, three questions. One is about browsing and serendipity. The other is about Sci-Hub, you've heard of Sci-Hub? And the last one is just about reference librarians, but I don't know if that's, so let me give it a try. I was just at Santa Clara yesterday, University of Santa Clara, and it looks like most libraries nowadays, you enter, there's no books, but you go down to the basement and you find some books. I have not found anything close to approaching browsing stacks on the internet. So I guess one question is, can you guys suggest some, something like that or anybody in the audience? I haven't found anything like it. And the message that's getting across, that I get across, when you eliminate books from the ground floor is browsing is a worthless activity. So I mean, I got this defensive message from all of you that, you know, books are things of the past. You know, I, I, it, for me, this is really important that books are not things of the past. Browsing is still an important thing. Students learn an incredible amount just by randomly browsing. So I'm going to hold off on the editorializing, but that was one point. A second, uh, should I do them one at a it, time? It would probably be easier. For, uh, yeah, right. we, we, compound questions usually cause problems. So okay. <laughs> um, let me just say a word about that. First of all, uh, we've got uh, about five million books on central campus, uh, and they're all in open stacks. Uh, browsing, and when I, I said books, book buildings are not enough. I didn't say book buildings weren't necessary. Book buildings are absolutely necessary. They're a major source of access to information that isn't available otherwise, and in ways that isn't available otherwise. We call these, in design, we call this an affordance. Browsing offers you a certain affordance. It enables a certain type of discovery, but so does 
browsing on the internet through hyperlinks. It offers a different type of discovery. It's, it's not the same, of course, but both of them are very useful. Uh, and, and absolutely, we can't afford to have all 12 million of our books on campus. Campus has other higher value uses it's decided for some of that space. Um, we, space is very expensive in Berkeley. It's very expensive here. We can't have all of our books on central campus for browsing, but the ones we do are the ones that we think get the most use for browsing and have the greatest value. So we put a huge value on that. This is, you know, not a particularly compelling solution, but uh, there are ways that you can browse the stacks online, both um, using call numbers for a particular library and also just for looking at all the books available in particular subject areas well beyond what would physically be held at one library. So Harvard, for example, wrote a really cool app that lets you browse their stacks virtually. And they have closed stacks. <laughs> so this idea that you could always browse the stacks is actually not true. I worked at Harvard for 15 years, and those, those stacks were not available unless you had given the pr proper incantation and gotten the magic card. So, um, you know, I love book browsing too, but it, it's not the case that it's always been equally available to everybody on equal terms. So. Ready for question two? Yeah? So let me tell you how I do research in, ma in mathematics. I'll type it in Google, I'll find the article, I'll find the DOI, I'll go to Sci-Hub, I'll type it in, I got the thing in 15 seconds. And when I go through my own library to do it, it takes like 10 minutes yep. to do the same yep. thing. So, yes. you know, I'm not gonna give up my time, right? I don't want to spend that extra 10 minutes. You were talking about heroines, Gunther. This woman who made Sci-Hub is like a total heroine for me. Uh, I just super admire lawsuit? her. Oh, I know what? it's illegal, so I have to go through Canada and stuff to do it. But, but it's, it's just yeah. a wonderful uh, thing. Yeah. So I, I'm not sure what the question is, but can you imagine yes. a situation where you partner with one of these... Um, illegal... I don't know what, yeah, right. Pirate Some, sites? Something, you know, yeah. because it's such a phenomenal site. Yeah. So, so, yeah, just, I'll let you answer in a second, but I want to say a couple of things about that. One is, thank you, because users of Sci-Hub have put the fear of God into Good. the major commercial publishers. They are scared to death. An example is what's happening in Germany where the government negotiates for access to Elsevier's journals, and they couldn't come to terms, so they shut off access to all the academics in Germany, and nobody cared. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't care. So after a month, they turned it back on, even though they didn't have a contract yet. <laughs> and they're still going around in circles on it. But the point is, things have changed because of that. And we can't, of course, endorse an illegal pirate site. But it's shown the publishers that things have changed. So there are a couple of initiatives. One I'm involved with is changing what you were complaining about, the friction of getting from the library site to the article. So there are technologies that would make that easier that the publishers have been ignoring for years. And Sci-Hub has finally kind of provoked them into making the effort to try to implement those technologies so that you can get to the legal content with a couple of clicks. We'll see if it works, but you know, it's a good thing that this pressure has suddenly come about even if it is illegal and bad. <laughs> right. And I, I'd echo that and say it's also a good thing um, because it challenges us to do better, yeah. you know, because in a way we, we've worked in an environment where we work with certain constraints because the way we get access to the material are through those licenses from publishers and we've tried to triage that in the best way we can through the systems we have. But admittedly, you know, if we subject it and if we subject those systems to the kind of methods that Jeff was talking about, um, really user-centric methods, we see very quickly that that breaks down. And it's another beautiful example of sort of the, the ways in which we need to do better to mediate the materials we, have in a very, very costly way, provide access to. And it's another piece of this puzzle of, um, of transforming our space and the way we interact with, with faculty in our space. So it's, it's, it's a real 
it's a real aha moment. And you know, the, it did not get, get unnoticed among uh, the Council of University Librarians when that article came out, looking at where SIHUB is actually being used. And we saw that SIHUB is being used in major urban centers where there are major research universities. And we all realized, well, by golly, it's our own faculty. Uh, you know, we buy this stuff for them and they go over there to use it because it's so much more convenient and convenience trumps everything. So it's a great, it's a great intervention with the publishers, it's also a great intervention with us. And, and just to be absolutely clear, we love Sci-Hub. <laughs> the, the vision of a librarian is, if, if inform, is all information be universally accessible easily. Uh, and findable, you know, so that it can be found quickly. So if we, we all envision for digital information, what we want is a single server that has access to all digital information in the world, easily found and well organized, and single click. And SciHub isn't that yet, but it's pointing in that direction and getting it out of the hands of individual publishers. Now, it happens to be illegal, and as good citizens and as public employees, we can't endorse that particular illegal service and we can't build it into our services, but it is a great thing, as Mackenzie said. I, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that the way to make it legal is open access. So we're, we're all committed to trying to change the publishing business model so that it no longer requires access control. And that will make it work beautifully for all of you. Last question. When I first got here, we used to have reference librarians that were people you could talk to. Now you can do it online, but it's not the same thing. So when SciHub bombs and I can't find something, uh, do you at Berkeley and do you at Davis have in-person reference librarians? Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth, do we? Because I don't. Where, where are they? Well, <laughs> where do I? Right, right behind there. you. Stand up. Stand up. How do? How do, I, how do I physically find you if I want to talk to you? Do I have to do it by email, or do I ever physically find you? So you have office hours listed online. Oh, the reference desk, and it's man. Or online, I imagine. <laughs> All right, somehow I can't find them. All right. One more? Yeah. Go ahead, Alex. Okay. There's one more Okay. Thank you. Alex Wolf, and I'm Dean of Engineering here, UC Santa Cruz. Uh, we've talked a lot about uh, the library as a social space and a collision space and interaction and students from dis different disciplines interacting and, and all. I'm wondering where um, issues of uh, diversity of um, uh, underrepresented minorities, of first generation university students, kind of plays into this whole uh, milieu. Um, I think that we need, that needs to be an explicit, personally I think that needs to be an explicit part of the conversation and to make sure that we're actually creating an environment that is welcoming and is not one that's simply uh, click, click in the old sense of the word click, click oriented. Um, and, and make sure that we are actually addressing a problem and not making it worse. You, yeah, please start. Yeah, first, absolutely. Uh, we, uh, I, I imagine all of us and all university libraries are absolutely committed to issues of social mobility and justice and diversity and inclusion. Um, as a couple of quick examples, uh, we, uh, all of UC is very committed to accessibility, and uh, at, at Berkeley alone, one of the uh, figure, facts I've learned since coming here that I love to repeat is we have more Pell Grant students at Berkeley than the entire Ivy League combined. Now, one of the things about that is that we have a lot of students who don't have very many resources, a lot of students who don't own laptops. So we have a laptop lending service at the library to make them available to students who don't have their own. Uh, one of the things in the redesign of Moffitt Library is that we went back to now having a 24-hour library, and it's not so we can have a sleep center, but it is so that people who live far away from campus, because more and more of our students have a one-hour or longer commute, we're becoming a commuting campus because nobody can afford to live in Berkeley, 
So our students come and they spend all day or all night, and we are now open all night, so, and we have lockers there so they can leave their books during the day. So we're very interested in providing support for a very economically and socially diverse community, and that's, that's really one of the strong, deep principles of uh, librarianship and always has been. Um, and I'll quote him, actually. A lot of students don't know what they don't know, and first-gen students are particularly uh, prone to that phenomenon. So the fact that they're coming to the library to study, because they do that, gives us an opportunity to reach out to them that I don't think other departments or parts of campus have. And we do that all the time. So we have uh, courses for first-gen students just specifically to help kind of uh, onboard them into the university. And we also see a lot of diversity in just the students who come through the building. So coming back to my point about serendipitous collision, I guess is the term we're using today, I've seen a lot of URM students come in to just to study or something and then notice something happening that just what they were oblivious to before and getting engaged. So it's, it's not something we're programming or, or trying to do, it's just happening. But it, it depends on the students coming to the library. So to come back to the point about making it welcoming, making it comfortable, making it useful to them, you know, if they walk in and see a wall of stacks, they will walk back out. These are students who don't know, you know, what the shelf browsing experience is. So part of the motivation for transforming these spaces is to draw in those students that you're talking about so that we can get to them. Right? But it's always that balancing act of how much do you invest in that over other needs. Yeah. I think this is one of the reasons I use the expression uh, gateway is precisely this point. Uh, this isn't just uh, because of diversity and socioeconomic and otherwise, although it's a big part of it. As with anything, there are cliques, there are people who are in the know, people who went to the private schools, who went to the better school districts, have much more awareness of what's possible, and they're gonna be very comfortable going to the advanced labs in engineering or anthropology or in the business school or whatever, and getting into the thick of things early on. They, they're comfortable getting into the thick of things. They know what it's like. They had parents who were college graduates and uh, are professionals. Those who don't have that in their background, who don't have that experience, they come to a big campus like our UC campuses and they are lost. They don't know how to get connected, they don't know how to get into the more advanced areas, and the library is a universal gateway that's welcoming. It's really the opening space to the great world of higher education and it's something we need to celebrate and something we, it's one of the great values we provide. It's universally open. It's a, Mackenzie uses this wonderful, wonderful phrase, omnidisciplinary, and that just signifies it. We are open to everybody and really are a wonderful place to bring people in who otherwise are scared of our campuses. I just want to mention that one of the terms I hear a lot is we are non-judgmental. So a student who's in an engineering building feels like they're on the spot. In the library, they don't feel that way. And they see the librarians as, as non-judgmental, too. The, the librarian is not their instructor. It's not somebody who can give them a bad grade. You know? So it's, I think it is important to have these third spaces on campus for students. And that's something we're very committed to providing. Um, Eileen Zerbriggan, uh, I'm a psychology professor and chair of COLASC. I was, thank you so much for these presentations. Um, I was struck by what I see as a disconnection perhaps between Gunter and Jeffrey, your presentations. Um, that, uh, so Gunter, uh, well, a synergy too, but Gunter, you're talking about the crisis in uh, publishing, that the costs are spiraling out of control. Um, open access potentially will free up some funds, but it's actually not clear. Um, you know, at best it might keep things flat. Um, and the wonderful um, connected learning space at Berkeley has, it appears to me, uh, a lot of spaces that are going to require not just a renovation but continued infusion of funds, the maker space and the, uh, the, you know, the digitization that uh, technology goes out of, um, it you know, becomes obsolete really, really fast. So this is just a very practical question about resources and it's very, um, it's very on our minds here at UCSC because our... Um, our budget is just a tiny fraction of even Davis, but certainly of Berkeley. So how are you paying uh, for all of this going forward into the future? 
I'll just say before I pass it to Jeff, I think you're right to make that connection and it's, it's one I'm constantly aware of as well. You know, as, as we spend more and more of the library's budget, and Elizabeth, how much are you spending on licensing here? It's two, two million, two point seven million. Two point seven million. And in percentage of your overall budget? 72%. Yep, so this library spends 72% of their budget with publishers. That's a huge opportunity cost for Elizabeth, because imagine what she could do if she could leverage that funding towards other things. So I'm always thinking about this, where we're buying ourselves the present, you know, we're buying ourselves access to um, the scholarly literature, but we're also mortgaging the future in that way, because we can't reinvest in the things that are important for the future. So I think the, this entire conversation of around open access is really an ongoing one where we're trying to find the path to figure out how to get off that roller coaster so we can, we can leverage investment elsewhere. Uh, yeah, doing anything costs money, no question about it. Uh, and, and resources are never infinite. Uh, this is part of my professional creed as an economist, your resources are scarce. Um, you know, a lot of what we're talking about, I think, is priorities. Whatever your budget is, you're spending it on something. You're, and it's, we're talking about where that spending should be and what the priority should be and what a mix and balance. There's a portfolio of things we all do. Uh, none of our UC campuses have the resources of a Stanford or a Harvard, and so we're not going to be able to do as much as they're able to do. No question about that. But with the budgets we do have, we still have choices to make about how to allocate those budgets. And so we're thinking about what are the best things for libraries to be providing going forward in the 21st century for our campuses, and how, how should we set those priorities? Um, another thing to think about, though, as far as uh, where the funding's coming from, you know, our, our people still act like we are poor and uh, there's no money, but we are actually wealthier in this country than we have ever been in history. Uh, there's more money, per, more wealth per capita than there's ever been in history. We're spending less on higher education, particularly public higher education. This is horrifying, it's shocking, it's puzzling, uh, and there's a lot of confusion about that in the world of uh, uh, political theorists uh, and uh, others about why we've chosen to start abandoning public higher education. But the fact is the resources are out there, and I think part of our, our job is to actually explain to the world and remind them the value we are providing, not, not just in libraries, but on campuses, and get the public to reinvest. Maybe not necessarily immediately through Sacramento. That's, you know, getting the, uh, the polity to invest it's a hard thing and the whole country has re reduced its investment. But there are a lot of people of wealth out there who realize the value of this and helping them understand that just giving money to Stanford is just giving money to Stanford, but we can have a much bigger impact. And so we're looking for funds for our innovation from our donors and for our new initiatives in data science uh, and education. We're looking for donor support to bring back the strength of the UC in moving ahead this, this great state. So um, I'm gonna uh, actually, no, well, I've got a few more things to say. Um, I just want to say that um, we have these great speakers here talking about what they're doing on their campuses. We are in a different situation at UC Santa Cruz where our budget is a fraction of these other budgets. Um, and looking forward, I think we need to think about, you know, what can we do and sustain across time and to meet various student and constituent needs. Um, so I want to thank all of you. And thank all of you for your participation.